Good afternoon. Okay, I had a bit of fun with the title. Um, and uh, what uh, we're going to cover is that uh, in my years in I industry, I've uh, developed a, a bit of intuition from putting dozens of uh, uh, ML products into production in a variety of uh, industries in a variety of company philosophies. And uh, when I transitioned to working on the industrial internet of things, some of those intuitions started to um, uh, be stretched a little bit. And uh, so let's uh, dive into weaving those together of what is intuitive about building an ML product and how did we have to stretch that a little bit for the industrial space. So first things first, what is intuitive machine learning? Um, and I have to admit that if you'd asked me this question at different points in my uh, uh, career, at uh, different points when I was doing even the same product, I'd probably give you different answers. So we, I took a step back and uh, had a bit of fun with, let's think of, let, let's all think of the best ML products we've seen make it to production and why they were a success. And a bit of it comes into the planning of how to get them into production. And if we look at the phases that those products went through, they roughly started with planning what you're going to do, understanding uh, where you wanted this product to go, building out the ML components of it, uh, testing it, making sure that it was, in fact, going to do what you thought it was when it went uh, to prod, and learning from uh, going into production and then finally releasing it uh, to the broader audience. And there's one aspect that I really like uh, that ML engineering has stolen from software engineering, and that is the uh, concept of the Boehm spiral, that you can't get your ML product correct the first time around. You're never going to get the best product uh, all in one go. That, in fact, you have to release and continue and iterate through this cycle, learning as you go and pushing your product into those more refined and uh, optimized uh, places. But this is too high level to implement. Let's dive a bit deeper. Planning. Planning is the easiest skip to, uh, step to uh, skip. It's, great. it's really easy to wake up and say, I have a great idea. I'm just going to build it. It's going to work, and it's going to be marvelous. But what really happens is that good companies make good decisions, and great companies need to take a step back and forego those good decisions to make room for the great ones. And in planning, you're taking all of your ideas, and you're prioritizing and understanding how do we make a great product, not just a good one. And the other aspect of planning is that there's a, a big chunk of the wheel left, and how you efficiently utilize those resources, um, if you do just an ounce of planning, it's worth a pound of uh, cure. Building, this is the phase we all love, and I've seen some marvelous talks today on how you can do uh, more advanced models and training, and this is the... Um, when you jump into it, this process can look a bit messy. You find more data, you update your model, you optimize it, and you continue to iterate through this uh, stage. But this is the part where it's fun to uh, spend time, because a lot of the problems that we see here are largely solved. And I know that's a tough statement to accept because it's so fun to work in this. But when it comes down to it, we need to identify early what the parts of the problem that have not been solved are, that put at risk making this ML product an actual success, and prioritize and focus on those. Testing. So testing should be uh, match the diversity of the user base and the gravity of the ML product's responsibility. Um, the larger the audience, the more you want to do in that uh, dog fooding and uh, taking a look at what this data is actually going to produce in the ML product. And I've I, I will call out that I swept a few things under the hood where I said, yes, you need to productionize it. Um, and depending on your setup and your infrastructure, that can be uh, either a flip of a switch or an entire project onto itself. Alrighty, but uh, it's worth calling out that the best ML products, as we said, you have to iterate through this uh, cycle many times. Take the moment to learn. What happens is we often work in these large, complex systems, but when we change or perturbate one part of the system, if we look at what happened across the board, we'll get a better understanding of that causal relationship from how one side of the system actually impacts the other. And those learnings, it's not just enough to learn and be, uh, it's not enough to be right. You have to evangelize those learnings out so that other folks working on this system have a better idea of how this system works when they go in to improve it. And the last bit is release. Several years ago, we were testing out models just to see if it was an idea worth doing. We thought, okay, this model, it'll last for three to six months, and we don't need to worry about it. But we're increasingly releasing models in aviation, releasing models in healthcare that have to go through FDA approval. We're releasing models that have an expected long life expectancy. And with that, you have to take the time to release it to 100%, pay down your tech debt, and also have a current process for making sure that these models don't drift over time and then you iterate through. 
And one of the things that uh, when I put this out and I was like, okay, great uh, ML products, they follow this cycle, I realized that one of the critical bits of why ML products are so difficult to estimate how much time they're going to take, and I see folks taking pictures, don't worry, all slides are online, um, is to do the mental um, challenge of can I pick an upstream um, stage, and if I change that upstream stage, and I've already done work on the downstream stages, does it affect all of the work? And it, it's a, a great game to play. So let's try um, define success metrics and design. Why should you define your success metrics before you do your design? Well, apart from the obvious that if you do your success metrics at the end of the process, you'll just define them to be whatever you did. Um, if you tell me that this project needs to make a 1% gain or it needs to make a 20% gain, I will fundamentally change the design of the ML product to match the expectations of what it needs to do. If in the, in the success metrics it needs to result in not perturbating the system too much but safety is a, a large concern, then you will change your design up front. If, on the other hand, the uh, success metric is that uh, you try something quick and um, you just want something out the door uh, quickly that uh, either has a zero or 100% um, uh, success, then your design is uh, going for that uh, unpredictable, trying to take that um, uh, Hail Mary pass at the end of the fourth quarter. Okay. So those are the stages. And one of the critical pits to know that your upstream systems are not going to influence your downstream systems is you have to have an owner that said, yes, we finished this, this, this uh, stage. You're good to go to the next stage. And this is a rough sketch out of um, if you had a well-staffed and uh, resourced team, how you could uh, assign owners to each uh, stage. But keep in mind that you do not need uh, five people to start a startup. And uh, at, uh, when you have one person doing the full cycle of uh, an ML product, this is closer to the hats that they need to wear at each stage. Now, there's one um, stage that I didn't call out, uh, that prioritization stage, that uh, stage that determines what you're going to build. And in fact, I found that that is wildly varying across uh, the industry. And in fact, that's a great litmus test for how your company is run. If your product uh, teams own your prioritization, your product run. If your data teams own your prioritization, you're data driven. Uh, similarly, I've even seen it where engineering and you can have leadership or one incredibly intuitive person determining how you um, choose which projects to develop. But whoever owns that stage, that's your litmus test for how your company is running. Okay, that is a lot of stages to get through. And getting through all those stages uh, is a beast. And uh, building ML products is an investment. But the other thing that we're starting to notice as we do more cycles of this wheel is that our work is reusable. And we're building those into platforms. And I love the development of platforms. Uh, we've, it's easy to see that how much development's been done into A-B testing platforms, um, optimization platforms. Um, and if we take this to the natural extension of where all these platforms come into releasing an ML product, this is my grand vision. This is where I would love to be working, where all of the effort you're spending is on planning. What do you do? Building it, making it work, and then learning. And if you can use platforms to reallocate your resources to plan, build, learn, you'll get around this iteration faster and faster. And um, that is a great spot to be iterating in. OK, so that's intuitive. What's counterintuitive? Uh, industrial Internet of Things, uh, I love airplane engines. Here's one of them. Um, it's not the people or the process. That stays largely the same. The counterintuitive bit is the context. And the context changes dramatically. So in the industrial internet of things, uh, GE generates about a third of the world's power. OK, let's have a think about that. If we made a 1% efficiency, that's the equivalent of magically getting free power to 20 million additional people. That power is also connected via their transportation, via their oil and gas lines, to additional engines. GE also makes about 60% of airplane engines. And those engines form that backbone that we love in, industrial, in, the, in the, the IoT space of, yes, I want my Amazon package inside of two days. They are the backbone that makes IoT possible. So let's take a look at them. So this is a GE90-115V. This is a, the beautiful beast. Um, they turned it on in a testing facility just to test it out, and it accidentally built, broke the uh, Guinness Book of World Records for highest thrust engine. It has far more power than the thrust used to get man on the moon. And on top of that, it's gorgeous. One of these fan blades, which is the big part that people love to take a, a picture of, um, 
the turbines on the other side is much smaller. Um, that the purpose of those flam, fan blades is simply to be an air filter. They move really quickly to siphon out the heavier air to the outside so that it doesn't get uh, soaked into the really tiny, um, well-machined uh, turbine bits. And they pulled out one of these uh, fan blades and they put it in the New York Museum of Modern Art as a, an exhibit of how industrial space could be beautiful. Um, the other aspect that I really love about these is that if you go up and you poke them, um, they're machine down to the level of a third of the width of your hair. That's how precise they are. But if you go up and you take a look at the fan blades, you can stick your finger between the fan blades and the casing. I'm like, wait, just a second. Isn't this supposed to be precisely machined? Why can I stick my finger in this gap? And what it is, is that as they get faster and faster and hotter and hotter, the carbon fiber composite in those blades starts to stretch. OK. <laughs> so uh, we. Aviation's been around for over 100 years, and uh, we trust aviation. We trust our airplanes to get us to our holiday when we want to get to, on holiday. We trust them to get us our Amazon packages. So what's happening behind the scenes that makes that possible? So while the airplane's in flight, it's uh, transmitting data via satellite to analytics um, uh, and databases. They're taking a look at all of the sensors coming out of the planes. Now, these sensors uh, are increasing as we get more materials and engineering behind them. I've, how can we put sensors on a 4,000 degree engine? Um, so we're getting increasing amounts of data, and that data is filtered by, is this in normal operating conditions or not? If it's not in normal operating conditions, it throws up an alert, uses the fleet monitor tool to show the monitoring team the hundreds of sensors on the plane, how they're trending over time, and that monitoring team is composed of folks that have degrees in aeronautics um, and decades of experience. It's amazing to talk to these folks on uh, how to repair airplanes. If they take a look at the data and they say, you know what, this is not inside of normal operating conditions, we need to escalate it, it goes to a shift lead who then communicates with the airlines uh, as quickly as possible how that plane needs to be monitored. Now this process has taken over 15 years to develop and it's continually iterating. The fleet monitor tool is updating. The innovations around what it means to have a fleet monitoring team communicate with a shift lead have been innovated on so that you have 24 seven uh, support for a variety of uh, countries and places around the world. Um, and uh, AI and ML has been welcomed into the space. It's viewed as the next iteration of how do we continue to innovate on this um, platform to, make, uh, to keep uh, planes uh, healthy. So what did we build? Um, we built a, a real-time in-production, human interpretable model, et cetera. Um, so what it does is it takes the uh, raw data coming out of the planes, runs it through uh, an ML service that takes a look and says, is this inside of normal operating conditions or not? And it provides a, a suggestion in the fleet monitoring tool uh, to the monitoring team of, uh, do I think this is safe or not? How confident am I? And a human interpretable string of um, what was the most likely feature, most likely sensor that you really need to go take a second look at to determine whether or not this is uh, uh, safe or not. But the other aspects that we got out of this uh, system was that it's continually learning from the monitoring team. As the monitoring team gets more of these suggestions and either confirms or denies those suggestions, the model can update and learn. The other part that was interesting is that uh, they've done an incredible amount of research and innovations on how to have the monitoring team self-check. But this was an external, um, independent uh, system. So that when the wise suggestion disagreed with how the person uh, handled it, we could sit down and look at that and learn across the table. So it offers independent validation. Um, so that's where we got um, speed was by helping folks get to the data point that they needed to get to as quickly as possible, and accuracy was in that uh, taking the best learnings from the entire team, transmitting them to everyone, and also in learning from uh, when they were in disagreement. So what was counterintuitive um, when we worked in this space? Um, the first bit that we had to learn was that compliance to regulations and customer agreements is actually a good thing. So what happens is when you ask about, OK, so why does the plane need to have this policy in place when these sensors hit these uh, readings? And what's happened over time is they've accumulated an incredible amount of knowledge of what is safe for planes. And if something non-safe for planes happens, they dive in and understand how could we have prevented that. And that's where regulations come from. So if you take a step back and understand where they're coming from on the customer agreements and regulations, that gives you more context on how you need to plan, build, and test. Uh, you need to test against uh, past known uh, problems. And uh, finally, um, how you release it. Okay, 
another counterintuitive um, bit. Um, as I've heard a couple of uh, folks, I think this might become more intuitive uh, in the coming years, but for right now, um, global domination is not the top line goal. When you're releasing um, to aviation for GE, you're automatically releasing to 60% of the airplane engines out there. Your goal is safety, reliability, and efficiency. So when you change from trying to expand to trying to protect, that really changes how you view testing. Additionally, that changes how you view um, design. So we didn't design an automated system that would uh, fundamentally disrupt how um, aviation maintenance is done. We designed a system that would work with what we know works well and keep that uh, baseline guarantee of aviation is going to continue to work well, we're just going to try and help improve it to the next level. And my favorite one that um, now I get to turn the brains on is um, we have big data, but it's not infinite and it's not cheap. If there's a new aspect or maintenance problem I want to catch, I can't ask the entire fleet to just go fly for a million more miles, simulate a couple of disasters and come back to me. I have to take the time to be clever. I have a limited amount of data, and that means in the build stage, we need to be more clever on what we do with the feature engineering and how we test it. Uh, we have to change our metrics to be um, much more sensitive to the long tail. So what's an example of being clever in the feature stage? So the first iteration that we built of this, we're like, great, we got a, an incredible model. We've used all the sensors from this engine. We've figured out how to uh, normalize across lifetimes because turns out engines age on different lifetimes, so time has to be normalized. Um, and we showed it to the aviation experts and we said, okay, these are the uh, alerts where the model and the people disagreed. Can you tell us what's going on? And uh, they noticed immediately that there was a common trend um, and they took a look at uh, what we got wrong. And they said, you know, you built a great model, but uh, did you know that there's two engines on the plane? And what happened was that uh, the aviation experts, they take a look at how both engines are performing to understand if it's an external uh, influence on changing the sensors or if, um, in fact, one engine is starting to deviate too much and needs maintained. Alrighty, and then uh, this is one thing that uh, I want to bring back to the uh, community, is that uh, I love the uh, Google brain. Uh, not only are we hitting the point where we can uh, be masters of communications with computers, we can have computers per impersonate each one of our communication abilities, um, but I want to throw that on the gauntlet with the Bob test. And Bob is, I'm not being facetious, there are a lot of Bobs in aviation, but Bob is a real person. And he lives in Cincinnati, and his job is that final mile of taking and synthesizing all of the data that came out of the monitor team, their conclusions of what's possibly going on with the plane, and to call the airline. And when he calls the airline, he's using the data that he has from the team there. He's using the understanding of the airline of where the plane is, how it's been operating, and he may ask for additional information of what does the pilot see. And they're negotiating through the data they have to try and come up with the uh, root cause of what's really going on, and to then design a safe plan of action for quick resolution. So if we can layer that communication with the synthesis of what's going on and those problem-solving abilities, I think that's the Bob test I want to throw out to AI. Communicate, but communicate, negotiate, and synthesize. OK. And the last bit I love about this is that if you enter into uh, the industrial Internet of Space, uh, the industrial Internet of Things space, you expect, okay, great. The first level of uh, these things being connected is that I can use the data from thousands of other planes and their maintenance histories to help me understand how the next plane's maintenance history is going to go. And that's the first order effect of using planes to help planes. But when we built this out, Power spoke up and said, you know what? We've got turbines over in Power too. Um, and it turns out there's turbines in a variety of industries. And that's where you get the second order effects. When we can take the innovations that we had to build to get uh, into production for aviation and then transplant that over and use that um, to bootstrap into helping uh, power, that's where you get the second order effects. So it took us five months to augment for aviation and we're currently building out power on a very quick time scale. And I'd love to hear the challenge of, if we got all planes to help all power plants, what's the third order effect? Where can we take uh, this industrial internet of things? So thank you. <laughs>